Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure for me today to be able to uh, discuss with you uh, some current and I think very timely uh, issues of the European gas market. Um, today is the uh, a meeting of the heads of state in, in Brussels and on the agenda here is also the issue of energy prices and of course energy prices are, as we all know, are very inter linked with gas prices. So I will talk about uh, the role of gas in the European energy market. Uh, you are aware that the International Energy Agency has not too long ago declared, well, we should have a golden age of gas. Uh, but of course, as it turns out, it's not yet determined if this will happen or not in Europe. Uh, it does seem to happen in most of the rest of the world, so gas is uh, becoming more popular and with shale gas uh, potentials all across uh, the globe, it's very likely that gas's role in the energy mix will uh, increase quite a bit over the next few years uh, and maybe in the medium term over the next 20-25 years. But uh, how much euro will be benefiting from these developments remains to be seen. So we are at a crossroad uh, and we do have to recognize in Europe that the landscape is changing. Uh, the global gas markets are undergoing one of the most fundamental changes that uh, has hap have happened in the gas market over the last probably 30 years. Uh, and most of that has to do with shale gas and here it says shale gas in the US but of course it's shale gas uh, production technology basically which has been very successfully applied in the US but is on the verge of being applied in a number of other parts of the globe. Uh, and the relative competitiveness of gas, either not competitive as now in Europe or very competitive as in the US, has a profound effect on the use of gas in the power sector, which I'll cover a little bit later. And then I'll go into what in my view should be done to secure the position of gas in the energy mix, which I believe is a very important development. Now, when we look at the IEA uh, energy outlook, 2011 that is, basically uh, you see on the top uh, right corner a number of dotted lines that go up and down and the IA is predicting or, and was predicting in 2011 but is also predicting now that on a global scale coal use will go down and gas use will go up. This is actually good news for uh, the environment because gas emits about half as much CO2 as coal and it has a lot less other locally environmentally damaging uh, emissions. The other on the lower side, on the lower part of the graphic shown energy sources are going to develop rather in a very continuous way and for those who are very much uh, fond of renewables, I think you have to be aware that with all our renewable hype, the share of renewables in the, in the global energy mix is still rather small uh, and it's unlikely to change massively over the next 20 years. Uh, of course, what happens in 50 years is sort of beyond our uh, reasonable uh, estimation powers. Now, uh, on the EU level, we do consider that gas will play a crucial role in the energy future and also the roadmap calls for natural gas as an important uh, energy uh, source to bridge the gap or to help integrate a larger share of renewables because gas is versatile, it's flexible, uh, it's relatively environmental friendly uh, and it can be used as a transition fuel. Now so in theory everybody agrees you know gas should play a role. Now how big that is, how much consumption that would mean is maybe a different story but it uh, sort of would be expected, it was expected to play a role. But as it has turned out in the last three years, since 2010, uh, price developments have made this uh, happening uh, or made this very unlikely to happen as anticipated. Uh, when you look here at the uh, price development of various energy sources, uh, you do see that over the 
last few years, that is basically since 2009, 2010, oil has gone up in price and uh, in parallel to that, gas has gone up in price, not quite as much, but also, but coal, the dark blue line, has actually gone down quite a bit. Uh, so the, the relative uh, competitiveness of coal versus gas has changed dramatically. And while until 2009 and, and 10, basically coal and gas had a rather similar development, uh, since 2011, you know, there has been a huge price spread. So gas is basically continuing to be expensive uh, in Europe, whereas coal has become very inexpensive. So the future role of gas depends on the competitiveness of prices. And here currently gas is losing out against coal on a very massive scale. Uh, on a more detailed level, you see here that um, you know, the lower price, the lower red curve is the Henry Hub price, that's gas price in the US, which has continuously since 2009 stayed with a few uh, small spikes on a very, very low level and is likely to stay that way at least for a few years in the future, maybe going up 10, 15, 20 percent, but by far not coming to uh, what's the average uh, sort of import price, it would be the second curve from the top, that's the German uh, gas import price, uh, which you see is around 12, uh, whereas the Henry Hub price is between 2 and 3. So here we have a situation where US prices are one third or one quarter of European prices for gas. Uh, that is a problem and you see the, the uh, black line. This is the gas price we would need to have gas competitive with coal in power generation. So gas would have to be less than half as expensive as it is today to be a competitive fuel in power generation. And of course, this shows uh, that the likelihood of gas playing a big role in power generation in Europe is rather far off and would require drastic changes. So oil currently is disadvantaged uh, and there is not too much uh, indication that this will change in the short run. I mean, what has happened basically is that in the US, uh, gas is replacing coal. Therefore, there's a huge oversupply in US coal, and this coal is being exported to Europe at low prices. So in a more abstract way, you could say the, the Americans are exporting cheap gas to Europe in the form of coal. And we are burning it with uh, a lot of enthusiasm and with significant volumes. Now, why is gas so expensive in Europe? There are a couple of um, facts or developments. First of all, the gas producers, they still cling to the oil price indexation, although the time when oil and gas were substitutable products has been rather long gone. So there are very few applications where oil and gas are real competing fuels. Uh, and so this is kind of the external uh, dimension, but the internal one is that in Europe we have been rather slow and not very um, highly motivated to push ahead with market integration. So we still don't have a full competition between suppliers. And finally, we are denying or ignoring the shale uh, potential that Europe does have in a number of countries, and we'll get to that somewhat later. And finally, uh, there has been uh, the changes in the uh, CO2 emission trading. Uh, we have removed practically the incentives for uh, CO2 uh, for, for generation technology with low CO2 content uh, because the CO2 emission certificates are so cheap at the moment. Now, the European gas market uh, needs a vision and the energy regulators have over the last uh, few years developed such a vision and very broadly discussed it until in the years of 2010 and 11. Uh, and we basically foresee a Europe where there is a number of liquids, liquid gas hubs with sufficient and efficiently used infrastructure, not necessarily the uh, 10 or 11 hubs shown here, but more likely four to five hubs. Uh, but that has to be determined on uh, commercial grounds. Uh, we would hope that in all those markets, which in some cases would span more than one country, the markets work very well. 
Uh, and then we have to assure that the gas also sees or gas produces see Europe as an attractive destination for the fuel and gas does flow to Europe. Now what have we done over the last few years to achieve that? Now the uh, implementation of the third energy package is uh, I would say reasonably on track. Uh, we have now in the gas sector a number of framework island network codes. The CAM network code has been uh, finally approved. Balancing is close before approval by member states. Interoperability uh, is also getting close to being finalized. Uh, we are talking now about tariff harmonization. Uh, and we also have new rules on transparency and some regional uh, market integration projects. So we are making progress, but, and I think that's important to mention, uh, progress is not as fast as we would want it to be. Uh, and in many cases, member states are also rather reluctant to push forward. I mean, the most uh, notorious example is the CAM, the capacity allocation uh, uh, management network code was approved a few weeks ago uh, by the council. But in the last second, the council said, well, yeah, we accept these detailed technical rules about capacity allocation, but we really want them to be, to be applicable only 27 months in the future. So member states are unnecessarily delaying implementation. And of course, producers are using this possibility to still sell gas at different prices in different parts of Europe to their advantage. Uh, we do have now, since a few days, actually, the energy infrastructure package uh, in force. So we also have some uh, European coordination mechanism and tools to assure that the necessary infrastructure does exist. Now, Europe on the surface would be well suited for a well-working gas market. We have about one third of local production, and then we have at least five or six big importers from Russia through Norway, Algeria, Qatar, Nigeria, and a couple of small ones. So it's a sizable share, a sizable number of companies. Uh, we also have one quarter of the import through LNG, which means very high flexibility, and the rest through pipelines. So in theory, we should have a good uh, possibility to uh, create a competition. And uh, I think now is the point where I would like to have uh, you answer the first question, uh, which is, which sources uh, of gas do you think will gain the highest market share in the future? Uh, so you should see on your screen on the right side the poll. Uh, and You can start answering them. Uh, I'll give you about a minute and a half or so uh, to do so. And we'll see what the general view of the participants is here. It seems we do have a number of people who are not so pessimistic about shale gas production in Europe answering the poll. We'll give it a few more seconds and then we'll close the poll. Okay, so you see the answer. So about 14% believe there will be a significant share of gas from the US. Um, about 67% think Russia will gain market share and about 19, 20% believe uh, that we will uh, overcome the blockage of shale gas. Uh, production in Europe, and we'll get into some of those issues in a few minutes. What we are seeing is that the global landscape for gas trading is undergoing very fundamental changes. Currently, we have a few countries that are major exporters. That's Russia, that's the uh, Middle East, uh, and that is also Asia and, uh, the, uh, and in Australia. And when you look forward a couple of years, we will see that the US, uh, which is currently an importer and exports only tiny quantities and imports more than exports, will change. So the, uh, the Americans will become a net exporter of gas over the next few years. And th those of you reading the trade press have realized that 
there seems to be now the approval of the second uh, leak verification terminal in Texas, uh, close to being uh, positively decided by the government. And we will see a significant uh, growth of export of gas in Russia. Uh, about the same amount of gas I would expect to be produced in the Middle East as now, so I don't see a big change here, but Australia will also increase its export uh, and will have more export from, from Africa, especially on shale, uh, on shale resources, but also on uh, newly found gas resources. So the major changes will be the U.S. will be a net export in 2017, which is a formidable uh, achievement considering that seven years ago, basically unanimously everybody said, well, the U.S. needs to import a lot of gas, and they were talking about like 100 BCM and more. And now there will be a net exporter. Australia's LNG exports will also grow significantly. They have vast shale resources and also conventional gas resources. Russian exports will rise. Uh, Europe's import dependence will grow heavily unless there's a miracle in shale gas. We will not see major shares of uh, either conventional or unconventional gas in Europe to be developed that fast, if at all. Uh, what is positive is there are sufficient supply sources for gas all across the globe and also around Europe. Uh, but the question is, how much do we have to pay to attract them to Europe? Uh, when we look at the market conditions in the EU, it has improved. We have more sources of gas, more suppliers now, instead of, you know, maybe uh, 14, this is going up to 20, 25. And we also see a share, a growing share of uh, gas traded on the hubs. Although when you look at the 2011 figures of 58% of the gas traded on the hubs, uh, the probably is two thirds of that is gas that had been purchased through long term contracts and then sold at a loss by the buyer uh, who was not able to sell it at the normal price to anybody. So it's kind of a mixed picture, but hub trading has definitely picked up and we see reasonable churn rates in large parts of uh, Europe. Now, what we see on this chart is that Europe, on a more formal basis, has a lot of gas around. It's boundaries, uh, has quite a number of additional sources like the Caspian area where there are vast gas resources that could supply Europe and probably the southern corridor will provide some gas to Europe from this area. So we should be able uh, to create competition and get the gas market going and achieve a, a fair price which is supply demand driven. Uh, of course we have shale gas which uh, we'll get into in a few minutes. But so far, we have not been able to make good use of this supplier diversity uh, because the, the price differentials have basically grown and they have not really decreased. So we have not been able to take advantage of the diversity of alternative suppliers and we have allowed them to avoid competition between themselves over the last couple of years. Uh, so the question that I want to pose to you now to get you a little bit engaged uh, is which way will the gas prices go in the future? Will they decrease? Uh, will we be able successfully to have more competition between producers? Will they stay roughly the same level in relation to other fuels or will they increase? So you have again about a minute and a couple of seconds uh, to share your view on which way the gas prices will go. It looks like a pretty tie between the views, so anybody who has strong views, please uh, use the possibility to participate in the poll. You want to get up to about 90% of the participants. We are currently standing at 85. Ten more seconds, and then we'll close the poll and share the results with you. Okay, so it's closed now, and we'll share it with you. And you see that there is a about 38, almost 40 percent believe the price will decrease. So that seems to be, in your view, hope for the gas consumer. About the same uh, percentage believes it will be this 
stay the same as it has been and only a quarter, 25% believe prices will go up. So uh, <clears throat> we will see what the, the reality brings over the next few years. Uh, currently we have to see that we have done a rather bad job in getting uh, the European gas market going. When you look at the different price levels between uh, Great Britain and uh, on the other hand, you know, Poland, Macedonia, I mean, you see there's a 25, 30% price differential. Uh, although you have rather uh, similar transportation costs and Russian gas currently is sold at lower prices to uh, customers in the UK than to customers in Bulgaria or Poland or in the Baltics. And no, I'm not talking about a few percent, I'm talking about 30-40%. So it seems that one of the, the reasons uh, why these price differences exist has nothing to do with transportation costs, but has everything to do with competition or lack of competition. And this uh, development where on the one side in the US gas prices are continuously low and in, in the EU they are going up and up in parallel with oil prices is creating quite a bit of competitive advantage for the US. Uh, you see here industrial gas prices where uh, the US has in the meantime through the cheap energy that shale gas has uh, produced for the American economy uh, added another one and a half to two million uh, jobs and uh, is looking at a revival of energy intensive industry, petrochemical refineries that used to be loss making for 15 years or 20 years suddenly become uh, commercially viable because the same development as we see in shale gas is now starting to take place in shale oil or tight oil uh, where we are getting a price difference between U.S. oil prices and European oil or world Brent oil prices of 15-20%, which is very good news for anybody who wants to build a refinery or a petrochemical plant in the U.S., but is very bad news for somebody who wants to do the same in Europe. And so jobs are being shifted out of Europe and towards the U.S., uh, which is uh, one of the topics which will be discussed today at the uh, heads of state meeting in Brussels. Also for consumers, we see a similar development. Consumers in the US have profited not that much as industry, but also somewhat. And consumers in Europe are paying significantly higher prices for uh, gas to heat their houses. Uh, what we see here is that Europe has also looked for the cheapest fuel. Uh, and for us, the cheapest was coal. And uh, basically, the import of coal from the US has increased massively over the last, let's say, year or so. Uh, and this coal is replacing gas as a fuel for power generation. Uh, when you look at the uh, generation mix between coal and gas in 2010, you saw that we used about twice as much gas as coal. And in 2012, we used about the same amount of coal uh, and gas. So coal has gained a significant market share in power generation. Now, what has been the result? The result has been that we are currently closing one gas-fired power plant after the other in Europe, because today with a gas-fired power plant, you burn money, and with a coal-fired plant, you make money. Uh, so you see that Stadtkraft, uh, GDF Suez and others have been closing plants. Uh, there's a big political debate about this. Uh, and so I want to go to the third question. Uh, what do you think uh, would help gas-fired power plants to survive? There are discussions in Europe on these things. Uh, and of course, we will see what the state aid rules allow uh, as a support. Uh, instrument. The Commission is working on a fundamental paper here uh, and I would like to have your views on the question uh, should we pay them subsidies, should we look for establishing capacity markets or should we reorganize the CO2 market to make less carbon intensive generation more attractive. 
So please participate in the poll. We had a 94% turnout the last time. So let's see what we get here. This is a topic that creates a lot of uh, heated debate. Uh, I want to share with you an interesting discussion we had at the Florence Forum last week, uh, where all the stakeholder representatives, you know, Euroelectric and IFIEC and CFIEC and IFED, all were highly critical, and of course also the regulators were highly critical of capacity markets. And actually nobody spoke out in support of that. Um, only the Commission said, well, member states have been coming to them uh, requesting to be allowed to subsidize their national champions uh, one way or the other. Uh, but it seems that most of the industry itself, so the companies, with probably some exceptions, are less than enthusiastic about capacity markets or some sort of uh, financial support for uh, generation. And it seems that uh, also the majority of the participants share the view, so we only have a very tiny fan group of subsidies uh, and we have a, a clear minority supporting capacity markets and a clear majority looking for uh, CO2 market reorganization. So this is an, an interesting uh, outcome here. Now let's briefly talk about shale gas. In the US, shale gas has uh, created a huge game change in the energy market. Uh, and of course the question is, could we do the same in Europe? I mean, we have potential. When you look at the left map, although it's a rather small uh, on your screen, I mean, it, it's, it's a map of the EIA, uh, and it shows there are substantial shale uh, resources in uh, Europe, uh, in France, uh, Poland, Germany, Netherlands, uh, also in the UK, in the continental shelf around the UK. So there are potentials, uh, but how much would it cost to develop these? Now there is a study which has to be taken as all those studies with a grain of salt because the people who produced many studies on shale gas in the US prior to this actually happening, they always predicted shale was too expensive to produce for 25 years. And only a couple of uh, engaged entrepreneurs somehow combined existing technologies and suddenly shale gas was much less expensive than anybody ever thought. So in light of that, uh, I think the, these numbers probably do warrant some skepticism, but basically they do show uh, that <clears throat> it is conceivable uh, that although shale gas in the US is less expensive in producing than in Europe, uh, still there is potential for shale gas in Europe uh, at a price level that's reasonable. Uh, so there will be higher costs, but uh, at the same time it seems the costs are not so high if we uh, have any luck in Europe and if we are as smart as the Americans, then we should be able to produce shale gas at a reasonable price. And those are some more closer estimates. So even in a dry environment, basically producing only gas and no liquids, uh, it seems we could get gas at around 18 euros per megawatt hour. And if you compare that with the 24 euros that are currently trading on the hubs and the 33 that we are paying to uh, Russia, that looks like an attractive alternative. And if we're able to focus on those locations where there's also some liquids available, then prices could be even significantly lower at 10, 11, 12. So financially, shale development in Europe would make sense uh, and would be commercially viable. Of course, there are many hurdles. And uh, I think yesterday I read about the Polish government's uh, attempt to, or at least discussion about extra taxes on gas revenues, on shale gas revenues, these kind of discussions, of course, could uh, topple the economics. Uh, but on a technical level, it seems shale gas would be possible to produce economically viably in Europe. And of course, it would also be a very big
benefit for security of supply if you retain uh, our indigenous production percentages, uh, which otherwise without shale would decline over the next 10, 15 years from 30 to maybe 20 or less than 20 percent. Uh, <clears throat> what is clear is that uh, in Europe, when we have a certain share of renewables, we do need a, a flexible uh, and as environmental friendly as possible energy source uh, to compensate uh, those hours or days where there is no wind or no sun. Uh, so we need some uh, possibility to generate power from other sources and gas seems to be a logical one. So although we probably will not use a lot more gas volumes, we are likely to use or to need quite a bit of gas capacity uh, because we might not run the power plants all year round, but you know, if we need to run them, they'll have to start up fast and become available quickly. Uh, if there is a wind still and a uh, day without any sun. Now, what in Europe we have not done at all so far, and I think this is a big mistake that we have not done anything, we have not look, looked at other sources for uh, or other uh, possible uses of gas. Uh, again, here in the US, we see that the shale gas uh, price developments have resulted in a very uh, low price for gas and new uh, applications for gas have come up. One was uh, in transportation, so a couple of routes are now uh, sort of switched over to um, gas-fired trucks, which are emitting less uh, microparticles, somewhat less CO2 uh, than diesel, uh, and of course are also much cheaper. Also in ships and in trains, people are looking at using LNG directly, so rather than regassing it, you would use directly LNG as a fuel for, as a bunker fuel for ships or as a fuel for trains. And again, there are quite a number of uh, commercially viable alternatives popping up. I heard a presentation of one of the, uh, head of the, one of the uh, board members of uh, the, I think, biggest railroad company in the US, and they are contemplating buying about 3,000 uh, sort of locomotives uh, fueled by LNG over the next few years. So there is a potential uh, and I think we have been more or less ignoring that, putting too much emphasis on uh, e-mobility where we have to recognize that so far uh, the use of electricity in transport is severely limited by the lack of battery capacity and of affordable batteries gas is there, the technology is actually there, and I think it would be important for Europe to look at those uh, applications in vehicles uh, and also to look at the possibility which is happening on a few experimental uh, installations so far, how we could store excessive uh, power generated by renewables in the form of gas. Uh, <clears throat> so here we come to the final polling question, uh, which is asking in which demand sector in the US, in the EU, will the gas demand grow? We have seen an overall decline in gas uh, demand in Europe quite a bit, uh, but I think if we go for some of those application areas, this could change. So the question is in which sector uh, do you think the demand will grow in the future? So, keep on voting. Another 30 seconds to go. I think we have so far not, uh, I mean, if you are part of the gas industry, uh, I think we have jointly failed to start a debate about other uses of gas uh, and probably should be much more offensive in, in going out and uh, alerting people, policymakers, and others that there are potential uses for gas where we could replace liquid fuels uh, with positive effects, especially in, in, uh, in densely populated areas. Okay, so we close the poll now. Uh, we have almost 50% LNG as a fuel for shipping and transport, uh, which is interesting because in the wider public, I haven't noticed any comments or uh, any written information about that, so I think we 
need to increase the uh, awareness of the public and uh, policymakers that this is a, a viable alternative. Uh, some CNG and some more power production. I'm sure gas companies uh, are desperately looking to become more attractive for power production and we will see uh, if they are together with you know, some support mechanisms able to do that. Now, <clears throat> coming to the end, I would like to just talk briefly about what has to be done. Uh, there is unfortunately not a simple answer. Uh, and I return to the roadmap uh, statement, which says gas is a natural resource to play an important role in the energy mix in the future. Um, with 25% share in the energy mix, helping to transit, transition towards a decarbonized economy and power sector. Uh, it is less CO2 intensive. Uh, it can provide backup for renewables and it can also serve as a electricity storage uh, sort of medium. Now the question is, what can we do to secure that gas can play this role? I think there are a couple of topics that we can do. I think we need to accelerate the integration of the European gas market, uh, irrespective of legal concerns and sort of legal instruments which are being implemented step by step. We need to push ahead and make sure that we are able to integrate the market much faster uh, than uh, the sort of the legal uh, framework would require because I don't think we have that many more years. I think we just follow the rules that are being developed, the ones that already are in force but not uh, are already decided but not yet in force. I think we will need another two, three, maybe even four years before we have a mostly integrated European market. I think this is a too long period uh, to uh, avoid serious damages to our economies if the price differential between European gas and US gas stays in this range of one to four. Um, we always had higher energy prices than the US, but this was like 20, 30 percent higher and not a factor of one to four. So that is a problem. So we need to speed up the market integration. There are possibilities to do so. Uh, there are possibilities that don't cost anything. That's more a question of uh, brain wear and, and political and regulatory resolve. Uh, I think secondly we need to be more proactive in uh, making sure producers have to compete with each other. Uh, we need to make sure there are alternative import routes available uh, and that we have enough capacity to allow LNG gas that's brought to some of the numerous LNG facilities in Europe to access more than one market, to access two, three markets, so to kind of go into the uh, core European market. Uh, and finally, I think we need to fix the CO2 emission uh, scheme because the way it's structured or the way it functions right now uh, is not going to provide any incentives to go for low carbon uh, technologies and if we want to continue that uh, I think then we really have to change uh, the CO2 system uh, and of course the real key here is to get the rest of the world to come with us and not have Europe uh, be the only part in the globus where CO2 emission management is a priority whereas in the rest of the world people don't seem to care a lot about CO2 emissions maybe they talk about it but they don't do anything so this brings me to the end of the presentation and uh, we move on to the Q&A uh, and if you are not being called up uh, then of course you're also welcome to send me questions and comments through the email address that's shown on this screen. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation and now we will be able to start the Q&A but I would like to give a little bit more time to our audience to submit their questions so I will ask the first question. Um, you mentioned that uh, all the development uh, in the future for the gas sector in Europe but you didn't mention the prices so what do you think what Europe could do to decrease the prices and have them maybe at the same level like in the US? Well, I don't think we will be able to have them at the same level as the U.S. I think this is 
uh, basically impossible, more or less, for us, for various reasons like higher production costs. Uh, the shale gas uh, deposits in the U.S. are much uh, uh, shallower than the ones in Europe, so the drilling is cheaper. The drilling in the U.S. happens at locations where they used to drill uh, close by, used to drill for oil for many years, so they are able to use the existing infrastructure there. We would have to develop a completely new infrastructure, for example, in Poland, because there was never any oil drilling there before, so we will have higher costs. But I think if we're able to integrate the markets, if we're able to remove a lot of the obvious barriers for moving gas in larger quantities across the EU, we could probably easily uh, force our suppliers to go down with the prices 15%, which doesn't seem a lot, but I mean, this is still billions. Uh, so we could probably, just with this price decrease, we could pay for you know, the, the Cyprus bailout in a very short period of time. Uh, I think the second topic is uh, if we are able to uh, bring in gas from new sources, uh, specifically the Caspian area, I think we would increase competition and have somebody, sort of a new supplier on the block, and that again would put uh, some pressure on, on prices. So I think Europe can do something uh, that this would uh, improve, but it would mean kind of jumping over some of the hurdles that we have erected for ourselves, uh, basically being overly protective of national champions, uh, and over-reliance on long-term oil index contracts as, you know, the ultimate uh, way to paradise in the gas sector. So a lot of the reasons why gas is more expensive in Europe than it needs to be are problems that we created ourselves. But if we remove that, I would say 15%, maybe a little bit more of price reduction is possible. Anything beyond that would require a significant shale gas development and will take time. Thank you very much. Uh, so let's right now proceed to the questions submitted by the audience. And the first one is, what would help gas power plants to survive? Well, <clears throat> first of all, I think um, we have to pose the questions, how many gas-fired power plants do we need to survive? Uh, we are, with high subsidi subsidization, uh, erecting new renewable power plants. and they are must run, as it's said in the energy, in the electricity sector. So they are running whenever the specific fuel, be it photovoltaic or wind is there. So basically they have zero marginal cost. So they replace any other power plant. Uh, and if we uh, build up new power plants at a time when consumption is not growing, then obviously some other plants need to be closed. And there is no reason why this couldn't be a gas-fired power plant. So basically what we're looking for is uh, a certain amount of gas-fired power plants to become available uh, to fill any shortages created by renewables that are not running at a specific uh, moment in time. Uh, and here I think uh, this concept that the Germans are now trying out is basically assuring or a power plant under the control of the trans transmission system operator uh, kept as a reserve for emergency situations. That seems feasible and that could probably assure the survival of a couple of gas-fired power plants. Uh, I don't think it's a big problem if we close a number of them. If we have too much generation and we don't use the electricity, then we don't need the power plants. But to be able to do that, we need at the same time to build enough uh, high voltage lines to basically dilute the renewable generation across a larger share of Europe, a larger part of Europe. And then I think we could have a combination of a few strategically relevant uh, gas fired power plants being kept alive by TSO payments, uh, and some of them uh, closed or mothballed for future application. And as some coal fired plants go out and some nuclear plants will go out of the market, there will be more demand for those plants in the future. Thank you. And the next question is the following. What do you consider as the most important issue of gas sector that should be underlined in the 2030 climate and energy policy framework? Cool. What's the most important one? 
I don't want to, to single out one is maybe difficult. I mean, I think the the most immediate benefit we would have uh, probably would be from a, a very quick implementation or realization of the common market. Uh, and I think the most important long-term strategic uh, benefit we would gain from starting uh, shale gas uh, exploration in larger parts of Europe, because I think if we would start to look for shale gas and do you know, uh, trial drilling in several parts of Europe, this would scare enough uh, the producers so they would give us a lower price anyway. Thank you. I think we'll have time for two or three more questions, so let's see how this goes. Uh, the next one is, how can long-term investments in the EU infrastructure be secured if gas prices are not linked to the oil index? Well, I mean, I think we have to, to separate this. On the pipeline infrastructure, it's actually very easy because we are moving on the gas pipelines to where we are in electricity. Uh, I mean, I have not signed up a 25-year contract for using electricity, but my TSO, my distribution network uh, operator and also the transmission system operator, they are sure they will get their money because the cost of the network is socialized. Today we have about half or two-thirds of the network being socialized already, so distribution network is socialized, so you don't buy your, you don't guarantee that you will use the gas capacity for in the distribution network. Uh, and about one third is, is funded in the way that shipper pays for it. So I think for the network in Europe, within the EU territory, we will move towards the socialization. So basically the consumer of gas, small, medium and large, will pick up the bill and will carry the risk if these pipelines are utilized in future or not, not the investor. Pipelines bringing gas to Europe is a little bit different here. I think uh, some combination of producers being involved uh, and long-term buyers being involved probably is still warranted for a couple more years. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the willingness of the buyers of the capacity also depends on their expectations if they can pass on the cost to end users. So at the end of the day, uh, always the end user pays for it. And I think in gas, we are also moving there. So this is pipelines. Uh, exploration is a different story. Um, I think exploration in other sectors, I mean in oil, I never had a 25 year coal linked uh, contract for my gasoline. Uh, and I didn't see any problem for the big oil majors to drill. So I think production doesn't need this kind of long term oil indexation. Uh, obviously the sellers uh, and their sort of state-owned companies, they loved this very uh, sort of predictable pricing formulas. Uh, but I think this is a situation of the past. Uh, it's, it will not come back. Uh, we are moving to hub-based pricing uh, more and more. So I think we have probably in the future more equity necessary for some of those investments uh, and more socialized cost and in those instruments, I think together, we can probably fund it. We have also for some parts of the European infrastructure, that's basically transmission uh, of gas, we have the infrastructure package, which provides some, uh, some mechanism for cost sharing among the beneficiaries. But I think it's more getting used to a new environment where the investor has to have a certain risk that he or she covers. Uh, and uh, the gas industry will be a normal industry that picks up the risk of doing business on their own. Thank you. And the next question is, how do you feel about the Black Sea as a significant source of gas supply to Europe? Well, I think the, the Black Sea and uh, also, it, it, I mean, the Black Sea is kind of halfway or not, not quite halfway between the Caspian and Europe. So. It does make sense to look for uh, gas sources there. I have no sort of first-hand information how much gas can be found there, uh, but there seems to be some gas uh, potential uh, in this region. And as it's sort of halfway on the way of Caspian gas to Europe, I think it does make sense to try to develop it. Uh, and maybe it's easier there than in some of the more core European areas. So yes, it is a source. 
Uh, I don't know if it's economically viable to produce gas there in large volumes. I think we should try it. Uh, and I think if we want to spend money on sort of furthering the gas sector, probably supporting through whatever specific mechanism exploration on European territory or very close to European territory is probably a better way to spend our money than on capacity markets for gas-fired power plants. Thank you. And this will be the last question and because it's a very interesting topic and but uh, I have to ask you for a very brief answer because we have to close very soon. Uh, but the question is, will Russia play a collaborative role within EU definition of EU energy production and market development or should we expect some problems? Well, I don't think we'll have problems with Russia. I mean, obviously, Russia is not very fond of uh, European attempts to develop the shale gas. So I'm sure Russia was very happy when France prohibited uh, shale gas uh, exploration in France. Uh, but I think Russia does recognize that Europe is its major uh, destination for gas. Uh, Russia has poured, or Gazprom has poured, quite a number of billions into Nord Stream and is almost going uh, on the way to do also invest a significant amount of money in South Stream. Uh, and once you build a pipeline and you are really motivated to put something into the pipeline to pay for it. So I think Russia wants Europe to continue to buy gas from it. I think Russia, I mean, with some reluctance, will eventually have to offer the gas at competitive prices. Uh, so I'm sure we'll have difficulties with Russia, uh, but I don't see any fundamental reason. I mean, we are together, a pipeline ties together the seller and the buyer of gas. Uh, and I think Russia will continue to be a major supplier of gas. I just think we should make sure that we have enough leeway for negotiation by assuring that there are also other sources of gas available to us in reasonable volumes. Thank you very much. So unfortunately now it's time to say goodbye. Thank you Mr. Volt for being with us. It was a pleasure to host you at the PSR webinars. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. I hope it was interesting for everybody. Mm -hmm.